to space uh, clay particles, or if we have a very low ionic concentration, this is going to be much larger. And between this and that, if you were to change the ionic strain, uh, you're going to have a, uh, let's make it go from right to left, this is going to be a swelling strain because of change of ionic concentration in the, in the rock. So uh, I, I was telling you before that this is linked to uh, wellbore stability. It is linked uh, to wellbore stability because when you drill a wellbore, and let's say that you're drilling through sand and a shale rich in in clays as you pass through with the drilling string and the drilling bit somewhere over here. What do you use in the wellbore in order to guarantee wellbore stability? and also to cool down the bit. Drilling fluid, dry or drilling mud. And uh, that drilling mud is made out of what? So you, you, you have, I'm giving you a hint there, right? It's the drilling mud. So what is that mud ma made of? Bentonite, bentonite and what? So bentonite, water, uh, sometimes you can add some other uh, materials in order to make that drilling uh, mud heavier. Uh, this is what you call a null-based uh, drilling mud. And as you drill, uh, also, uh, yes, 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 uh, I was thinking on the, on the next one. I already gave you the answer to the next one. But uh, this is going to be a water-based drilling mud. As you drill some of that uh, water-based mud, uh, it's, it's going to get in the formation. That's something called leak off, right? So if you are in sand, probably it's going to reach further away. If you are in shale, probably it's not going to reach that far away. But In, in, in principle, uh, there is no reason why you would add uh, any salt to your drilling mud. Why, why would you add salt to the drilling mud? In principle, there would be no reason because this one make, makes it very viscous so, so that it doesn't enter into, into the pores very quickly. This one makes it the mud that makes it fluid. This one makes it heavy uh, because to increase the, the pressure. But in principle, there will be no reason to add any salts. But it turns out that the ionic concentration in uh, geological formations is usually very high, much higher than what you will have normally in a drilling mud or what you will have in, uh, in fresh water. And your mud, usually you prepare it with, with fresh water. So if you inject this drilling mud with a very low ionic concentration, which is somewhere over here, and you replace the fluid in the pore space of the shales that, was, that had a very high ionic concentration, what you're going to produce around the wellbore are uh, swelling stresses because now, let's say that this is your wellbore. Uh, if your shell starts to swell, um, it's, it's going to be able to swell inside the wellbore but not around the wellbore because it's constrained. There is a, a cylindrical geometry. So you have, you're going to have an increase of hoop stress that may turn 
into something which are called breakouts, which is sheer failure. We're going to talk about that later on, okay? Uh, but, but here the concept is just, it's just very, very simple. Uh, I, I like that you remember that the ionic concentration of the fluid can cause swelling stresses in shales. And actually, let me think. Um, I don't have that yet in my notes, but I'm, I'm working on that chapter right now. But uh, I have an example of that. Let, let me see if I can, I can pull it out quickly from here. So uh, it's a very good image of an explanation of that. So and, any questions about, about this phenomenon? Yes, Robert. Yeah. Would that mean that the ion concentration in the drilling mud would increase? And since the drilling mud is also a clay, that would cause the reverse. It would cause like contraction. Yeah. Mud. Yeah. But but since but you have so much drilling mud and it's a fluid that any changes of volume, they're not going to to affect uh, anything. So no, no, no. It's, it's not. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see what do I have in here. Okay, so okay, so I'm working now in this chapter. Oh, by the way, um, I I'm gonna come back to to the website. But into, into the website, I already updated the part of fault stresses on faults, and I put all the equations nicely now. Uh, so, so if you want to check that again, please be, be, be welcome to. So this is the example I was talking about. Uh, let me zoom in here. This is an example of a, something that lo looks like a rock, right? It's a, it's a shale. It is dry. And uh, it, it was uh, recovered from a well bore. And after you expose this rock to DI water, uh, you just you get that. You see, it's it's uh, the the clay starts to swell, and that swelling actually breaks the rock and and make it now uh, a bunch of clay uh, all disaggregated rather than the rock. You can break the cementation between the grains. You can you can really you know change completely the rock as as it uh, absorbs some uh, fresh water. Uh, OK, so let me go quickly through here. So you're going to have to work. Um, I didn't bring the, the project today, because we're going to talk about that next week. But the next project is going to be about wellbore stability. Okay, And I'm hoping that f by next week, I'm going to already have the new chapter on wellbore stability uh, over here, uh, but I already added the part of stress and falls and fractures, and and this part of the tensor method that I know guys you like a lot, right? Matrix multiplication, vectors. I think that was a lot of fun. Uh, all right, so uh, so how do you solve this problem? How do you solve this problem of so you will have, okay. How do you solve this problem? You add salt to the, to the drilling mud. If you add salt to the drilling mud and you sort of equilibrate the ionic concentration of the mud and the hydronic, ionic concentration inside the shale, there is not going to be any problems of uh, wellbore uh, instability. But sometimes, you know, if you add too many salts, uh, that may get corrosive and it may be expensive. So there are some other solutions for that. So what do you think which other alternative solution for that could be? You instead of using water based mud, you use a null based mud. And now because this is going to be uh, oil, uh, it's not going to it doesn't have any any water well it has some water on it, but it's kind of isolated. But you're not gonna have you're gonna you're not going to strip the ions out of the out of the shale. So you're going to change the chemical composition of the shale. So this is one solution. Uh, the other solution is to use 
something which is called underbalanced drilling. Why do we have leak off in this case? The pressure in the well is uh, larger than the, the pressure in the formation. That's why you have leak off, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be leak off. So in underbalanced drilling, what you do, and if it is possible, it's not possible all the time, but sometimes it may be possible that you drill with a pressure lower than the formation pressure. So you create a flow that you're actually slowly producing the formation as you're drilling. And if your permeability is not very high, as is usually the case with shales, you're not going to produce any, almost any fluids. Uh, but also you're not going to cause the fluids to get into the rock just by diffusion, but not by advection. Uh, you're going to avoid a lot of these uh, instability problems. All right. Uh, let's see, how are we doing with time? We have half hour. Uh, so let's see example number two. And I have a very cool video to share with you as well. This is a very fancy topic nowadays uh, because it's, it's kind of a new phenomenon that has been discovered and that could be utilized in many, in many applications. And one of them is in oil and gas, but there are some other applications too, uh, as the one I'm going to show you right now. Uh, let's first look at the video and then we'll, we'll see what, what's going here what is going on over here. OK, so all right. So, so you see that's a, uh, we could describe it as just a piece of metal that it's moving on its own. It doesn't have a, an, an engine inside. Uh, it, it's just, you see, moving, moving on, on its own uh, wi without a, any, any, any powered uh, device inside. <laughs> you, you, are, you are more familiar than what you think with this concept. Um, I don't know if you have experience, you know, when it's very humid that your hair kind of like may get curlier. And it, it, would, it, would, it would deform. It would be more difficult to comb your hair when it's very humid. And that's because of uh, the humidity and the absorption of molecules in, in, the, in the walls of your, of your hair are going to cause something which is called absorption-induced uh, deformation. Basically, you're adding at the molecular level forces on the walls of the solid that make it deform. Uh, so what, what is this? There was another example of this that I saw today, uh, which is, let me come back. It was, a, oh, this one. You see, this is like sort of like spider. There is somebody blowing there. Uh, with, with that um, with that tube and uh, no I don't want to play and as you change the environmental humidity the, the solid the solid deforms so there are many applications in material science for this but there are also applications in uh, geomechanics basically what we see in this case is that as you increase the relative humidity, a hair that may be relatively straight, as you increase relative humidity, starts to bend, and then uh, it may turn into a curly um, hair because now you have added strain to it. Uh, so. 
it, it is it is subjected to stresses right now uh, because all of those uh, sort of molecules uh, on the surface of the hair. But let's look at an example more related to oil and gas. In organic, organic rich rocks, uh, you can have organic matter. That organic matter, uh, for example, in, in source rocks, uh, is the responsible one for generating oil and gas. And in the case of uh, source drugs in the gas windows, it usually happens that the gas molecules, some of those are in what is called bulk conditions, but many others are absorbed to the, or absorbed, I would say, with D, to the wall of that organic pore. The organic pore likes those molecules. Don't ask me why, but, <laughs> but I, I just know that, that that's the case. So there is a preferential uh, and a higher density of molecules near the walls that uh, inside, inside the pores. That absorption uh, leads to changes in surface stresses. Uh, it's, a, it's a concept similar to surface tension. You know that surface tension, the origin of surface tension are the molecules uh, pulling with respect to each other at the molecular scale. So you have a surface and all those molecules are just pulling uh, in, in one direction or, or in all directions, but you, if you have a surface there's going to be in one direction in which you cannot have an interaction, so that's going to create an interfacial tension. Well, very similar to this, when you have this phenomenon of adsorption, you can end up, especially with organic rich pores, in, let's say, if this one was your pore before, you're going to end up with something that relaxes the surface stresses in the solid and causes a, a swelling strain. So, uh, and this is going to be caused when you have sorption. When you have sorption, you will tend to see that you have a swelling strain. Uh, when you have desorption, you will tend to have a, a shrinkage strain. This sort of fluid can be, especially we're talking about gas, can be methane, can be uh, CO2, can be nitrogen, can be H2S, can be, can be many things. So uh, let's talk about a little bit, before we go into the mechanic part, uh, mechanics part, let's talk about sorption. What is sorption? And how you can describe sorption? This is when adsorption is a physical process which involves interaction. Okay. In her as opposed to intra intermolecular interaction between some sort of fluid holes in a surface. Let's let's say this is adsorption, okay? I talk about sometimes adsorption, about sorption. Uh, generally I when I say sorption I want to refer to something more general. But let's just talk about adsorption, okay? In, in adsorption, as Robert said, you will have a surface that we're going to consider that it doesn't have any porosity. It's, this is a solid. And in that surface, we'll have a preferential uh, attraction of fluid molecules because of molecular interactions. And in that location, next to the surface. So if you were to plot the density, uh, this is distance, if you were to plot the density of the molecule 
uh, or the fluid phase, you will tend to see something like this, where there is a high density close to the wall, it starts to level off, and it tends to a asymptotic value, where that asymptotic value is the bulk density, and there is going to be an absorption amount which is called an excess, let's call it absorption, excess absorption amount. Because why it's called excess is because it is an excess of what you would expect uh, in the bulk phase. All right. So now, now let's apply this same concept, but now as a function of pressure. So if I were to plot the amount of moles per unit of volume, and in a given uh, organic rich rock, rich rock, and that is a function of pressure, how would you expect that amount to increase as a function of pressure? How? There are going to be two parts. One part is going to be what you would expect just in bulk conditions. So I, I, I don't know exactly what would be the shape of this, but let's imagine it's like that. So that would be the contribution of the bulk, and that can be described by an equation of a state of say methane, carbon dioxide, whatever, is proportional to pressure. The higher the pressure, the higher the density. But with this type of phenomena with sorption, we're going to have an additional component that is going to make that amount uh, to be higher. And whenever this bulk concentration is relatively small, we can simplify this. And, and this, that's what we're going to do right now, just to make it easier. Uh, we're going to assume that this follows uh, what is called a Langmuir, Langmuir absorption isotherm, where this is NL is an asymptotic value, PM is a curvature uh, factor, which is also a constant, and P is the pressure. So th this is just about a fluids, uh, fluids amount in, inside uh, the pore space. So let's come back to the sorption part. Well, it happens that, as I explained before, that we can have sorption-induced strains. If to the same solid you were to measure now what is the strain as a function of time. Let's make this one volumetric. And let's call it the absorption volumetric strain. You will tend to see that the strain is also proportional to the amount of sorbed uh, fluid. So the higher the amount of sorption, the higher the induced strain. and also, the higher the pressure, the higher the, the amount of induced strain. So if you were, for example, to, to have a process of sorption, you will have swelling. So sorption will lead to swelling. And desorption will lead to contraction or shrinkage. And in order to put this phenomenon into the, our constitutive equations, uh, we can expand the pore elastic theory uh, to consider strains, stiffness tensor. Uh, we're going to put pore elasticity here because it's part of the problem. And here, we're going to put an additional term, which we're going to call a, an absor 
adsorption stress. So can, can you guess what is going to be the adsorption stress? Try to make an analogy with thermoelasticity. How would you, how would you measure an adsorption stress? So if we come back to this example, this is, this is an unconstrained swelling. Or also, if we, if we talk about in terms of uh, pore elasticity, that's what is called an unjacketed experiment. So you put the rock inside a vessel without any, any jacket around, any membrane, just put it inside the fluid, increase the pressure, and you measure what is the expansion. You will measure, in that case, the swelling strain. But if opposite to that, you inject fluids, so they sort in the pores and you do not let the boundaries move, and you keep it at the same strain, you will measure an absorption stress instead of a swelling strain. But the final consequence here is that uh, as a function of pressure, because this one, absorption stress, is also a function of pressure, when you change pressure in this type of rocks, you're going to change you're going to have pore elastic changes of strain, and you're going to also have chemoelastic changes because of the sorption component. So let's run this through, through an example, OK? Uh, and it's actually a, a real application example. Um, it's one of my favorite papers. Uh, Are you guys familiar with cold bed methane? Cold bed methane, it's a, a type of um, natural gas recovery that comes from coal seams that are very deep. And because they are very deep, it's, it's not economically to, to recover them, to mine the coal, but uh, you just you drill a well bore into the what is called the coal seam, and you decrease the pressure. And when you do that, you're going to produce some water, but you're also going to produce some gas. So, so here is your wellhead, and you, we're going to be producing gas uh, out of here. Similar as what we have seen before, usually we have an overburden stress with a constant vertical stress. If you were to make a zoom onto this type of rocks, you will find that these are more or less blocks of organic rich. It's not as perfect as I'm drawing over here, okay? But this is just in schematic, it's in idealization. But you will find that you have fractures, which are mostly orthogonal, and vertical fractures, which are called cleats. And those fractures separate blocks of coal that have very small pores inside. So the gas, in this case, is contained both in the matrix of the rock, in sort condition mostly, and also in the fractures. But it's mostly inside here, inside the very small pores in the rock. OK. Before we go into the analysis of the depletion path, uh, I like that we first figure out what is going to be 
the permeability. What is the, are you guys familiar with permeability laws for uh, fractured media? Cubic? So what do you mean with cubic? K is equal? Divide it. Times the separation between the fractures. So if this is S and this is H, uh, the permeability of fracture medium is going to be proportional to the width, the cube of the width of the fracture. And you can link that variation of the width of the fracture to a term which is called fracture compressibility. And when you do that, you can also write a variation of permeability uh, with rather than with the width, because the width is something very difficult to track or to define. It's going to vary everywhere. But something much easier to, uh, to measure or to track is going to be the effective, in this case, horizontal stress. And using these concepts, you can show that the logarithm of permeability is going to decrease linearly with the magnitude of effective stress. All right? So if we are doing depletion, what, and this is something that you already know, we're going to decrease the pressure with time. So this is going to be bottom hole pressure. And we're decreasing it with time. Okay? So let me, let's say we start here. We decrease it because we want to produce fluids, and then we're going to keep it constant. I want you to tell me what's going to happen with the vertical stress, total vertical stress. So we're lowering the pressure now because we want to produce fluid. What's going to happen with the total vertical stress SV? It's going to, it's going to stay constant, right? We're not changing the overburden. So SV is going to remain constant. Uh, what's going to happen with the minimum horizontal stress, SH. Let's, let's assume that the, the SH max and SH min are the same, okay? So let's just call it SH. What's going to happen to SH? It's going to increase, decrease, 